Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 9th of July 2017. Well, System D, System D, you had one job to do, one job, but that wasn't good enough, you had to do loads of jobs, and now vulnerabilities have been discovered. Last week we had a vulnerability with the processing of DNS responses and that a malformed response could cause a buffer overflow attack. This week we have a username which starts with a number is given root access. This is a blog post from Matthias Gina, giving perspective on systemd's usernames that start with a digit get root privileges bug. So how the bug happens? If you have a systemd unit file that looks like this, the service should start as the user, zero day, but it will actually be run as root user. This is definitely a bug because Red Hat and other derivatives do allow usernames to start with a digit. It is systems D passing of user equals parameter that determines the naming does not follow a set of conventions and decides to fall back to its default value root. Okay, it's hard to believe someone could not think that that would be a bad idea because looking at it retrospectively, it certainly sounds a bad idea. So why the big fuss? If you quickly glance over the bug and especially the hype media loves to blow this up, oh, of course, it can come across as if every username that starts with a digit can automatically get root privileges on any machine that has systemd installed. Which, let's be frank, is pretty much every modern Linux distro. This is not the case. You need a valid systemd unit file before that could ever happen. So it might be a security issue, but it is hard to trigger. So here's the potential security risk. You could trick a sysadmin into creating a unit file, hoping that they miss this behavior and trick your user into becoming a root. You need an exploit to grant you write access to systemd's unit files in order to escalate your privileges further. Okay, fair enough, so it is not that big a security risk, but it most definitely needs fixing. From Bleeping Computer, researchers extract RSA 1024 keys from popular crypto library GNU PG. A team of eight researchers from various universities has found a bug in libcrypto library that allows an attacker with local access to extract the RSA 1024-bit private key that was used to encrypt local data. The research paper was focused on GNU PG, and the researchers say they found that libcrypt used a method known as sliding windows to compute part of the mathematical equations behind data encryption. The problem they say that sliding windows is a computation method known to leak data via side channel attacks. The research team says the libgcrypt team had only patched two of three attacks known to be capable of leaking bits of an encryption key. Starting with this simple discovery, one of the attacks that was never patched, researchers put together an algorithm that combines several previously known attack methods to recover a full private key. This allowed researchers to decrypt any encrypted data by that file, such as local files, emails, or backups. So the issue has now been fixed. So if you are using GNU PG and libg crypt, suggest you apply the updates. Now unfortunately, what's the bet that the NSA, GCHQ and other government spying organisations knew of this and never disclosed it? Hmm, I wonder. Another article from Bleeping Computer, CIA malware can steal SSH credentials and session traffic. Oh, this is just getting worse and worse, isn't it? WikiLeaks dumped some documentation on two CIA hacking methods known as Boffin Spy and Grey Falcon, both designed to steal SSH credentials from Windows and Linux systems respectively. Both tools are implants, a term that CIA uses to describe malware payloads. Once installed through various means on a target computer, these two implants hook into SSH-related processes and steal credentials or session traffic where possible. According to a 27-page manual dated in November 2013, oh dear. This malware can target distros such as Red Hat, Ubuntu, SUSE, Debian, and CentOS. It works by targeting the OpenSSH client from where it can extract user credentials for active SSH sessions and full or partial SSH traffic. The stolen data is saved locally onto an encrypted file and is exfiltrated at a later date. So I suppose not a direct vulnerability against SSH. There has probably been another vulnerability exploited on the system in order to get this malicious payload and program running on it. And from there it is exploiting locally the SSH process. So three security articles this week against exploits and open source. And this is um, 
a situation that just seems to be getting worse and worse as the year progresses. I was listening to a talk recently that suggested that Microsoft are doing a lot better in terms of security with Windows 10. And as sad as it is to say, looking back, I do believe they're right. Oh, but I didn't say anything about their ethics, usability, memory usage being better. No, just the security. And this is because Microsoft have gone and taught their programs well in terms of security. And this is a situation we now need to catch up in the open source world. However, I do believe the situation will get worse before it gets better. But let's hope things do improve. Anyway, onwards with the rest of the news. Linux Mint 18.2 has been released. And looking at some of the changes here in Cinnamon, so we're now up to Cinnamon version 3.4. One of the notable improvements is the handling of desktop icons. Icons can now be automatically aligned to a grid, either in lines or in columns. They can also be sorted in various ways by name, size, type or modified date. You can also change desktop icon sizes with a click of the button. And desktop icons are now handled in a separate process which isn't tied to Nemo. Ah, very nice. The various plugins of the settings daemon also now run in separate processes and are independent of each other. It is therefore now much easier to identify which plugin might be responsible for high memory usage and when a plugin crashes, it no longer affects the rest of the Cinnamon backend. And in terms of upgrading, it is now possible to upgrade between Linux Mint 18 and 18.1 to version 18.2. There's been a new release of Zorin OS 12 Lite, and they've moved to an XFace desktop. So they've moved away from LXDE to XFCE. They have kept the familiar Zorin look. And what are they saying? The low spec can be run on systems that are up to 14 years old. Okay, fair play. Some updates with the Ubuntu development. There's just one I want to focus on specifically. It is with Unity 7, since we're losing Unity 7 officially now and moved to GNOME. We also expect Unity 7 session to still work in Ubuntu 17.10, but there will be some issues along the way. We've started to list known and expected issues. The known and expected issues include some integration with the GNOME applications, probably more on the theming side. No online accounts, shared G settings keys, DejaDup settings panel, and Unity Launcher integration. Some applications are using LibUnity to integrate with the Unity Launcher. This is kind of as I expected that Unity 7 might be in the repositories, but there is no guarantee of it working. Fast spreading copycat Android malware nicks pennies via pop-up ads. This is from the register. A powerful, fast-spreading Android malware strain dubbed Copycat has infected 14 million Android devices. So it is designed to steal ad revenues, and it roots compromised devices, enabling persistence. Injecting code into a Zygote, a daemon responsible for launching apps in the Android operating system, allows miscreants to receive revenues by getting credit for fraudulently installing apps. They achieve this after substituting the real referrer's ID with their own. At this point, it seems to be targeting devices more in Asia and comes from third-party app installs. And I expect they're probably fairly big in China where, um, let's say, users are after the free version of applications rather than anything to pay for. And by sideloading applications, you bypass all security protection of the Play Store. I suppose another problem is now the number of unsupported Android devices. I expect it is well over and above the number of supported Android devices that are currently in use in the world. Certainly looking at my phone and the phones of many of my friends have, we're all unsupported now, abandoned by the device manufacturers. And no doubt more of this malware will appear over time. So yes, it is a vulnerability in older versions of Linux. Nothing much we can really do about it without any updates. From OMG Ubuntu, Snap App integration in KDE Discover is picking up pace. KDE Discover is shaping up to be the go-to store for installing applications and add-ons on Plasma Desktop, and now we learn it's improving the handling of Snap Apps too. The Snap backend for Discover has been in testing for a while, and the integration for Snap App is now more robust and simpler to maintain, and we should see it ship with Plasma 5.11. Snap application and adoption is really picking up due in part to its distro agnostic distribution potential. Snap developers will be keen for their snaps to be used by as many Linux users on as many distros and desktops as possible. 
but there is still some way to go for that. One of the biggest gripes in terms of desktop snap apps is the current lack of theme integration mainly around GTK and Qt themes, but also including fonts, icons and more. The good news is the work to make desktop snap apps look as good as they run is on the way. Those UI tweaks combined with greater visibility in software stores like KD Discover and GNOME Software point to a more promising future for snap app adoption. From Fossmint, Lollipop, a new modern music player for Linux with GNOME desktop integration. I know we have quite a lot of uh, music players with Linux, but to be fair, this one does look quite good for the GNOME desktop. Looking at the snapshot here, it looks like uh, quite a lot has been integrated with the application title bar. You have the play, pause, rewind, track player position, all integrated into the application title bar. I know that's not a style that I particularly like, but it's a way that GNOME have headed, and it is interesting to see an application make good use of that feature. It is difficult to gain much of a perspective of the application, really, other than we're seeing some nice fancy album artwork cover in the music player, and looks like we have a genre selection on the left-hand side. Well, it also says popular albums recently added, random playlists, radio stations, and all artists. And there's some instructions here if you want to install it onto Ubuntu. There's a new metadata editor being added to GIMP. There we go, metadata editor. And a metadata viewer. There's a lot of tools shown in that version of GIMP. Is that something I'm missing? A uh, standard install or is this just a newer version? The new features will be available in version 2.9.6 and 2.10. Now for an amazing use for a Raspberry Pi. Brewing beer with Linux, Python, and Raspberry Pi. A handy how-to for building a homemade homebrew setup with Python and Raspberry Pi. I'm not going through this article in detail, but let's just scroll down because he shows the application in use. It's just the one that's been built. Standard Python application. Craft beer Pi, which is written in Python and has an active community. Cloning the repository and getting started only took me a few minutes. The README also has a good example of how to connect this temperature sensor, along with notes on interfacing hardware to a Pi or chip computer. On the startup, Craft Beer Pi walks users through a configuration process that discovers the temperature probes available and lets you specify which GPIO pins are managing which pieces of equipment. Very nice. A very good use for a Pi. And now for this week's stupid news. And thanks to Depressed Table for sending me this through Twitter. Bonkers call to boycott Raspberry Pi Foundation over gay agenda. A completely batshit crazy petition, even by change.org standards, is calling for a boycott on the Raspberry Pi charity on the grounds it apparently promotes a gay agenda. The issue appears to be a small rainbow featured on the foundation's website. I do not believe it is appropriate to use an educational product as a vehicle to promote gay, lesbian and transgender causes to our children, shrieks the call to arms. Not only that, but apparently the foundation is opposing anything that supports a heterosexual lifestyle. They want to tell your children it is okay to be gay, even if you as a parent work diligently and carefully to put your child on a heterosexual path. Gaining this acceptance is step one to a path of homosexuality and the Raspberry Pi Foundation needs to leave this to the parents, not to give it away on their website, on a path to their product. The petitioner takes umbrage with unsurprisingly being labelled a homophobic bigot when raising the issue on the Raspberry Pi forum. And at time of recording, the petition has received 48 out of 100 signatures. That was a week of Linux news. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.